the Lord. To God be the glory, great things he has done. I believe you are all doing him very well. This morning, I would like to thank the Lord on behalf of myself and my family for everything that the Lord has done for us. And also to express our appreciation to all of you for your wonderful support to us over the last three years that we have been here with you. As you know, God willing, this might appear our very last official visit to you as your area head. Next time, God willing that I will be here, I will come as a visitor. But that is how things work out. So once again, we would like to say a big thank you to all of you from the leadership, to all of you for your massive support to us and the ministry. Over the last few weeks, that we started going around the assemblies and the districts to say bye-bye to them, one message that has been on our heart is the very message that we are sharing with you this morning. And the title is, There is a Civil War in Your Life. There is a Civil War in Your Life. This message is seeking to explain why somebody may be a very good Christian going to church every day and doing all the things that church members do, but somehow, somehow, such a person can be overtaken by sin. Such a person can be overtaken by temptation. So that is what this message is trying to explain. We are reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, and then we continue from Galatians 5, 16 through to 18. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. May God himself, not another God, but may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. From this passage of scripture, we see that every human being who has been born again has got three elements working in him or her. Three elements. As we sit here, as born again Christians, these three elements are in operation. So I want us to look at the verse again. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, that means as we sit here, we are made up of spirit, soul, and body. So these are the three things making up our being. Spirit, soul, and body. The seed of the soul is in your mind. The seed of the spirit is in your heart. And so both the soul and the spirit are living in the body. So these are the three things that we are made up of. And Paul Concluding his first letter to the Thessalonians said, 
May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Normally, when we are ending a church service, that is when church leaders and pastors pronounce this to the congregation. But this morning, I want us to look at it from a very different perspective altogether. But before we do that, let us read from Galatians 5, 16 through to 18. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other. So that is where we see the civil war. The Bible says they are in conflict with each other. They are at war. They are fighting against themselves. The spirit is fighting against the flesh. So that is where we find the civil war. And that is why I have labeled this message, there is a civil war in your life. They are in conflict with one another so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Amen. This particular message will take us through the Bible. So we are going to read extensively from the Old Testament. We try to scan through the Bible and then come and end again in the New Testament. The Bible tells us that God created man, that is human beings, out of the dust of the ground. But it was a mere claim. So God had to breathe into the nostrils of the clay that he had formed before that clay became a human being, a living being, according to Genesis 2.7. So God breathed into that the nostril of the clay to cause it to become a living being. That means that when God created human beings, Adam and his wife were made up of these three elements. That is, Adam and his wife had the spirit, they had the soul, and they had a body. Just like all of us seated here. But then the Bible tells us from Genesis chapter 2 verse 16 through to 17 that you and the Lord God commanded him, you may eat freely from every tree in, of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. I want you to take note of that. God said that the day that they will eat of that fruit, that day they will surely die. But you and I know that when Adam and his wife disobeyed God and ate of that forbidden tree, did they die? Immediately, they didn't die. But God said, the day that you will eat of this fruit, you will surely die. But these people ate, they didn't die instantly. Does it mean God was lying on that occasion? So, we all know that our God will never lie. So, what was God trying to say here? The Lord has said, the day you shall eat, you will surely die. They ate, they didn't die instantly. But something happened. The word of God was fulfilled. The day they ate, they died. 
So how did they die? I want to hear from you. How did they die? Yes, how did they die? They died spiritually. That means the spirit aspect of them died. I've told you they were made up of three elements. The spirit, the soul, and the body. But when they ate of the fruit, they died spiritually. The spirit aspect of them died. And it is the spirit aspect that is able to connect with God. No wonder when God decided to come and visit them, they decided to run away and hide under some canopy of trees. The spirit aspect of them died. And because they died spiritually, they were left with soul and a body moving about, doing all that they could do, and then giving birth to children. But from that day, something happened to humanity. It happened that anybody who was born from Adam and his wife became spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. That is why 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 22 tells us that in Adam all died. In Adam all died. So because of that disobedience, all those who were born through the genealogy of Adam, all were born spiritually dead. So Adam died spiritually. And in that condition, he gave birth to his children, and therefore all their children were spiritually dead. It is for that reason that all of us who came from Adam were also born spiritually dead. No wonder the Bible tells us from Psalm 51 verse 5 where David said, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So, the day you were born, even the day you were conceived, you were already a sinner. You were spiritually dead. That is the reason why we see the firstborn of Adam and his wife, that young man called Cain. He killed his brother without showing any remorse. He didn't realize that he had even committed any sin. And when God came down to question him, Cain, where is your brother? Instead of giving a very nice response to God, he rather retorted, Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? In Ghana, we will say he gave God a cheeky answer. He didn't realize that what he had done was wrong by killing his own brother. It tells us that at that time, the man was spiritually dead. When somebody commits a sin and he doesn't realize that what he has done is wrong, it is an indication that the person is spiritually dead. It is for that reason that when we give birth to babies, when we give birth to babies, our mothers will tell us, when the baby starts talking, what are some of the early vocabularies that they come up with? Dada, mama, and then what happens again? What are some of the vocabularies? I want to hear from the mothers. Tell me. Is there nobody here to talk? Oh. Do I have people here? Mothers here? Normally, what do the baby say? I didn't get that word. So they sat with that, that mama, and the rest is insults. Insults. Insults of all kinds. 
So the question is, who taught these young babies how to insult people? Who taught them? It confirmed the fact that they were conceived in sin and they were given birth to in sin. Nobody teaches a child how to sin. If I'm to ask you, when we were young, when you were growing up, how many of us here never stole our mother's sugar? And who taught you how to steal your mother's sugar? How many of us have never stolen meat from our mother's soup? Hey! Nobody taught you how to steal. But you go to that place, that kitchen, and then you look left, look right, look everywhere to ensure that there's nobody there, and then you steal. You steal the sugar, and then your mother will come and ask you, have you taken some of the sugar? And then you lie. Who taught you how to lie? Meanwhile, there are particles of the sugar on your cheek. It tells you that we have been conceived in sin and we have been born in sin. Nobody teaches us how to sin. Now, if you have a small boy and then you buy him a loaf of bread, you give the bread to him and then he's happy. Then within a few seconds, you say, can I get it back? Let me give part to your brother. Then he says, mm -mm. who taught him selfishness? Who taught him how to be selfish? And if you grab the uh, bread by force, and then you break half and give it to his brother, then this small boy becomes angry. Who taught him how to be angry? Which school in Ghana teaches anger? How to be angry? The thing is in the person. So all these confirm the fact that we were conceived in sin and we were born in sin. Nobody teaches us how to sin, but we sin anyway. In the same way, brothers and sisters in the Lord, because we were conceived in sin and we have grown in sin. So, conceived in sin, born in sin, grown in sin. That is why some people have become experts in sin. They sin with impunity. At the same time, when somebody commits sins, then he's happy. For example, if a person is a drunkard, professional drunkard, and then he drinks his head off, he goes everywhere and he's booze, vomiting all over the place. Then he wakes up the following morning and then goes to his friends. And then happily he tells the friends, hey, Charlie, Charlie, yesterday, yesterday, ah, I had it. All the same, the thing that he did, misbehaving all over the place. He thinks that by boozing, he has made it. Oh, yesterday, I took 17 bottles of beer. And then he's happy. If he's a womanizer, he brags about the number of women that he has sexually misbehaved with. So he goes to his friend, hey, Chale, hey, Chale. You see, that young lady, the fair-colored one, I flawed her. Uh, the fat one, too, I flawed her. The slim one, I flawed her. The dark one, I flawed her. Even the latest one, that lady who came to reside in this community, oh, that one, too. Uh, Chale, hey, Chale. We were conceived in sin, and we have been born in sin. That is why when people commit sins, they are happy. If he's a swindler, swindler, somebody who can use his mind to manipulate other people and grab money from them, he thinks that he's so smart, then he goes around bragging, ah, Charlie, hey, hey, that man, that man, I have closed him. I have done, I have done this, I told him this and that and that and that, that. He didn't even realize that I was deceiving him. Hey, Charlie, as for me, I'm a smart guy. The effects of sin. When human beings commit sins, they are happy. All because of the fact that they are spiritually dead. 
to confirm that condition of human beings. Let us turn our attention now to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and we read from verse 59. Luke 9, verse 59 and 16. One day, Jesus was moving about with his disciples. And he met a young man and told the young man, young man, come and follow me. Then the young man said, Jesus, I would love to come and follow you. But please, allow me to go and bury my father. And after that, I will come and follow you. And Jesus told the man, look, you come and follow me, but let the dead bury their dead. Let the dead bury their dead. What does it mean? Is it possible for 10 dead bodies to be assembled here? And then nine of them agree that we are going to bury one. Is it possible to do that? It is not possible. But Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. So what does it mean? For the dead to bury their dead. What that simply means is that in the eyes of God, anybody who has not yet given his or her life to Jesus Christ is spiritually dead. And so, if this person who is spiritually dead dies physically, that is, the body also dies, and then his friends, who are also spiritually dead, but uh, physically alive, take him to the cemetery, and then they are burying him, then what they are doing is fulfilling what Jesus Christ said. I don't know if I'm explaining myself well. You, so you see, all those who have been giving their life to Jesus Christ are spiritually dead. That one has been established. But physically they are there, doing their jobs, marrying, giving birth, eating and drinking. But when one of them dies, and they are going to bury him, those people who are doing the burying or the burials, these people are spiritually dead and they are burying somebody who once upon a time was spiritually dead and is now physically dead as well. So in that sense, the dead are burying their dead. I hope it's clear now. So let the dead bury their dead. That was what Jesus Christ said. All these confirm the fact that when somebody is not a born-again Christian, in the eyes of God, that person is spiritually dead. The good news is that all such people who are moving about, spiritually dead people, the Holy Spirit is hovering around looking for an opportunity to save them. I was expecting an amen to that. The Holy Spirit is hovering around looking for an opportunity to save them. Now we turn our attention to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Genesis 1 verse 2 to explain something to you. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Let us read. Genesis 1 verse 2. The Bible says, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Hallelujah. At the beginning of creation, that was what happened. The whole earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. So this whole ocean, the sea that we see, there was total darkness. Total darkness over the face of this ocean. But the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So just imagine this whole sea covered by darkness. And the, the Spirit of God was also hovering over that darkness. What does it mean? Just to keep it in shape. In the same way, 
anybody who has not yet given his or her life to Jesus Christ and is moving about, living in darkness, you still have the Holy Spirit hovering, 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 hovering over such a person in the hope that one day the Holy Spirit will get an opportunity to call this person to come to his, himself that he is a sinner. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So, brothers, what happens is that when all these people who are spiritually dead are moving about, the Holy Spirit is looking for an opportunity to save them. Then one day, the Holy Spirit makes it possible for them to realize that after all, their lives are empty and they need Jesus Christ. Such a person hears the word of God. And the moment he hears the word of God, the Holy Spirit makes it possible for him to be convicted by the word of God. And then he says, I surrender. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to become a born-again Christian. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the moment the person decides to give his or her life to Jesus Christ, two things happen. Two things happen. This Holy Spirit, who has been all the time hovering around looking for an opportunity to save that person, the Holy Spirit plus the Word of God that was shared to that person combined, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit enters into that person's life and immediately causes his spirit that has been dead from his mother's womb to come back to life. Yeah. Hallelujah. So before somebody can become a born again Christian, the Holy Spirit plus the word of God. Can we shout that together please? The Holy Spirit plus the word of God. These are the two things that enter into the person. And the moment it enters, these two things enter the person's life, his spirit that has been dead all this while come back to life. Any ah. time Paul is teaching like this, Paul will say that, behold, I show you a mystery. What I'm sharing with you now was what Jesus shared with that great man called Nicodemus in John chapter 3. When Jesus met him, Jesus said, you must be born again. And then Nicodemus said, look, Jesus, look at my beard. I am an old man. How do I enter into my mother's womb again to be born again? Jesus said, I'm teaching you something spiritual, but you are understanding it from the physical. You must be born again. And then Jesus said, unless a man is born of the spirit and the, flesh, uh, and the uh, water, he cannot be born again or he cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless a man is born of the spirit and water. So what does that mean? The spirit and water. Most of the time, some people think that the water represents water baptism. It's wrong. It is not water baptism at all. But the Bible tells us that the water represents the word of God. According to Ephesians 5, 26. Ephesians 5, 26. Which reads, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Through the word. So the water there represents the word of God. And that is why we are saying that the spirit of God plus the Holy Spirit enters into that person and causes that person's spirit that has been dead all this while to come back to life. Oh, hallelujah. And when that happens, we are able to say that the person has been born Again, so when we say somebody has been born again, if that person is 
tall like me. He does not reduce in height. Does he? If he's fair colored, does he become dark? If he's a woman, does he become a man? The physical features are all there. Nothing has changed. But something has gone on inside. Something has taken place inside. So when we say somebody has been born again, we are talking about spiritual birth. The spirit aspect in him that is dead, that has been dead all this time, has come back to life. And that is why we say born again. And when we say born again, it means that once upon a time it was born. But something happened, it died. Now it has been born again. In the same way, the word that can be used is that the person has received the rebirth. Rebirth. We suggest that once upon a time he was born, but something happened, he died, and now he has been reborn. Another word that is usually used is regeneration. When we say that the person has been regenerated, what it means is that once upon a time, he was generated, but something happened, he degenerated, and now he has been regenerated. So from generation to degeneration, now to regeneration. Thank God, you have been regenerated. You have been born again. And when you are born again, it is the spirit aspect in you that has been born again. And therefore, the moment you are born again, you have become your whole totality. That is, your whole, all, the, all the elements in you have become active. I hope you understand. We started by saying that when God created Adam and his wife, they were made up of how many elements? Let's mention them. Spirit, soul, and... But because of the sin of Adam, the spirit aspect died. Now when anybody becomes a born-again Christian, the spirit aspect comes back to life. And once it comes back to life, then you are made up of how many elements? Oh, tell me, how many elements? Three elements. And so we are now full. We are now whole. And that is why Paul was able to tell the Christians in Thessalonica. So we now move back to First Thessalonians. So turn again with me to 1 Thessalonians, where we started from. And let us try to understand something. What Paul was trying to say here was that these people have had their spirit aspect regenerated, born again. And so they were made up of three elements. That is why he said, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. That means we cannot pronounce this on people who have not yet given their life to Jesus Christ. Because such people the spirit aspect in them is dead. So you can only pronounce it to born again Christians. And today, I want to join the great apostle Paul in making this pronouncement over your lives. Even as we leave you. So, I say, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body become blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I was expecting a bigger amen. Another one. Another one. So as we leave you, 
we are praying that may the God himself, not even an angel, not even any other being, not a software, not anybody, but may God himself take care of you through and through. Oh, you are to the totality of your being. May he take control. And may he take care of your spirit, your soul, and your body. That these three elements are kept blameless until the day Jesus Christ arrives. So that wherever we find ourselves, we can all meet him in heaven. Hallelujah. Now turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We are still scanning through the Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. We want to read it from the King James Version. Because that is where the King James Version drives from the point. So Ephesians 2, verse 1, from the King James. And you have he quickened. I like the word quickened. And you have he quickened. What does it mean? We are now explaining that when somebody becomes a born again Christian, his spirit that has been dead all this while is brought back to life. That means when we use the word quicken, it is just like trying to start a car with a flat battery. The battery is dead. So when you turn on the key, what happens? What sound do you hear? Krrr, krrr, krrr. It means the battery is dead. And then you bring in a new battery or you jump a battery from another source onto this car. The moment you bring it here and then you start it, it means you have quickened it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So when the Holy Spirit and the Word of God enters into that person whose spirit has been dead all this while, immediately the person's spirit is quickened. Thank God for the day you became a born-again Christian. That was the day that your spirit was quickened. Quickened back to life. Hallelujah. Now we are going to read Ephesians chapter 2 from the NIV. So take your Bibles, and if you have understood the message up to this point, I believe you're going to enjoy this aspect as well. Ephesians 2. In the book of Ephesians, Paul was trying to remind the Ephesian Christians about their past. And among other things, he said this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. As for you, that is born again Christians, you were dead in your sins and transgressions. So the question is, have we ever died before? Have we ever died before? Or have you ever died before? I see some people shaking their heads. Have you ever died before? Hey. Are you sure? Then I'll have to sit down. I have not been able to communicate properly. Have we ever died before? How did we die? We die spiritually. And it is just by the grace of God that we are now alive. So Paul was trying to remind them of their past and telling them that as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying 
the cravings of our sinful nature. You, so you remember when you were not yet a born again Christian, you were gratifying the desires of your sinful nature. So you wake up and your sinful nature tells you, go and sleep with three women. You just obey and go and do it. The cravings of your sinful nature tells you, go and drink, you drink. Go and take somebody's wife, you take it, and so forth and so forth. Paul was reminding them about all those filthy activities. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature objects of wrath, but, hey, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. Made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Hmm. So it means that all of us were dead. But God in his own mercy had mercy on us and has decided to make us alive. So brother, sister, today by the grace of God you are alive. You are alive. Alive in Christ. Your spirit is alive. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, all of us would have been dead spiritually and misbehaving all over the place. Thank God Jesus has been merciful unto us. Brothers, when you become a born again Christian, it is your spirit that has come back to life. So what has happened to the flesh, the body? What has happened to it? Has the body repented? Oh, am I talking to people here? You see, it is the spirit aspect of you that has been born again. What about the body? What about the body? It remains the same. It hasn't changed. Nothing has happened to it. So the body remains the same. So now we go back to Galatians chapter 5. And we look at what is there. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, 18. As we read earlier. So I say, live by the Spirit. So the three elements in your life. May, I mean, these three things. God is telling us that we should live by the or we live by the flesh. Live by the spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, which is the flesh. So if you are a born again Christian and you live by the spirit, you will not gratify. You will not do things that the flesh wants. You know what happens is that when you become a born again Christian, the spirit that has become born again wants you to do things that will please God. But the old flesh, the old flesh, the sinful nature, the body, wants you to continue doing those old, 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 old things. So that is where the civil war starts. Whereas the spirit wants you to glorify the Lord, the flesh wants you to continue glorifying its desires. So listen carefully. So I say, live by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other. Hmm. The two are fighting, fighting, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Hallelujah. 
So turn to somebody and tell him or her for me. There is a civil war in your life. There is a civil war in your life. And this civil war will continue until Jesus comes. Hmm. So you see that now that your spirit has been born again, always you are struggling with sin. Let me give you some examples. Now that you are born again with 17 Bibles under your armpit, you come to church, you dance, you somersault, you jump around, you speak in tongues, you do all sorts of things. When somebody insults you, what happens to you? When somebody insults you, what happens to you? Oh, am I talking to people here? What does the body tell you? The moment somebody insults you, what does the body tell you? The body tells you, ah, oh, you also have to retort. I'm going to ask a question to the men. You are a born again Christian, all right. You are in your room, maybe praying, reading your Bible. And then all of a sudden, call, 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 you say, come in. And then before you are aware, there stands a very beautiful young lady, naked. When that happens, I see the concentration of the men here. When that happens, what does your body tell you? Talk, talk, talk. In a very sincere manner, talk. What does this body tell you? Meanwhile, you are praying, you are reading your Bible, and then there stands this beautiful young lady, and then playing her games. Oh, I'm talking to people here. What happens? Then you see the body begins to tell you something. If you are not careful, then you do this. Ah. And then the body will tell you, oh, who will close his mouth when only is dripping from the roof? Then the body will begin telling you, Oh, the spirit is willing, <laughs> but the flesh. Then the body will begin telling you, ah, God is merciful. When you finish, you can pray. God will be merciful unto you. So the body will begin telling you so many things. But the spirit, the spirit, the spirit will be telling you in a still small voice, you are a born again Christian. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. But the flesh will be pushing you. So that is where the civil war intensifies. I'm telling you something very practical. You are in an office with your pen, official pen in your hands. And when you add two zeros, two zeros to the figure before you, you have become a, an instant millionaire. In that situation, what does the body tell you? Meanwhile, you haven't completed your building. You have school fees to pay. You have family matters to settle, and so forth and so forth. So in that situation, the body will be telling you, just add it, just add it. Am I here with people? There is a civil war in your life. The issue is that when you misbehave, when you fail to listen to the Spirit of God, and you listen rather to the flesh, you do it, you commit the sin, and then the Spirit of God in you becomes sad. That is why Ephesians 4.30 says, that do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You see, if you are going to sin, the Holy Spirit will warn you. And if he warns you and you don't listen, then he is grieved. Grieved. Next time you go and do it, he warns you and then you wouldn't listen. He is grieved. And then you continue doing that. 
Then something happens. You get to a time when the Holy Spirit is quenched. So 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 says, Do not quench the Spirit. So there is a difference between grieving the Holy Spirit and quenching the Holy Spirit. Continuously grieving the Holy Spirit will ultimately lead to the Holy Spirit being quenched. And when the Holy Spirit is quenched in you, from that time, you sin with impunity. If before that time, you were taking boyfriends, girlfriends, misbehaving, and dodging, doing things, grabbing other people's wives, grabbing other people's husbands, when the Holy Spirit is completely quenched, now you sin with impunity. And that is where you say that you come out, and then you say that, hey, hey, pastor, that man, that, that, that man, I will also marry him. Even though he's married, I will also marry him. And then the wife comes out to challenge you. You say, ha, ah, did the mother produce him for you alone? I will also marry him. So you come out openly. Church leaders will question you, say, hey, pastor, as for this one, and then take your church. Take your church. The spirit is quenched. There is a civil war. You seem very quiet. Let me give you another scenario. Very interesting and funny one. You are a born again Christian and you have decided to fast for a day. As for today, I am not eating from morning to six o'clock. And then you begin praying, 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 praying. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. Hey, ba, 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 ba. hey, yeah, yeah. By 10 a.m., what would the body tell you? 10 a.m., talk, let me hear you. The body tells you that you are hungry, so find something to eat. The civil war is there. Then you say, no, I am determined. I will continue fasting. Then you continue praying, praying. By 12 o'clock, what would the body tell you? 2 o'clock, what would the body be telling you? 3 o'clock, what would the body be telling you? Then the, the hunger intensifies. There is a civil war in your life. So the body will be telling you, oh, so since morning that you have been praying, has God not heard you? You are hungry, find something to eat. Then you say, no, until 6 p.m., I will not stop. Then you go on your knees, praying, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Then, all of a sudden, right behind your house, you hear a certain woman shouting, Dokonshu! Dokonshu! Oh! Dokonshu! And she uh, oh. From that time, what happens? Tell me what happens. As for and you also, you like the dokunu, you like the kenke, kenke fried fish, and then the shito, you like it. Pa. Then you say, no, 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 for me, let me keep on praying. Hey, hey, Jesus, hey, Jesus. Then the woman gets to that side and then shouts again, Dokonshu. Then suddenly the body will tell you, look, by six o'clock that you close this prayer, this, this Dokon, the kenke would have been finished. But this particular woman's kenke is very nice. So why don't you buy some and then put it there so that after six o'clock you can break with it. Are you here with me? Then you wake up from your prayer. Go outside there, mommy, mommy. <laughs> Give me four balls, four balls of kinky and then four fishes. Add some shito, eh? Yes, hot pepper. And then you put it by the corner there, and then you cover it. And then you go back and then begin praying, Jesus, Jesus, hey, yeah, yeah. Then the fan, the fan, the fan in your room is turning, turning, turning. 
Then suddenly, the scent, the scent from the food passes through your nostrils. Hey, there is a civil war in your life. Then your mind tells you that, oh, why don't you do something? Go and check, go and catch, go and check. And then <laughs> you go there, you remove them. <laughs> Before you are aware, you have already finished too. There is a civil war <laughs> in your life. Oh, hallelujah. And the civil war is between who and who? Your spirit and the the flesh, these are the two fighting. So you ask yourself, what about the soul? I've told you that the seat of the soul is in the mind. And so, that is the deciding factor, the referee. Whether you win the battle or not depends on your frame of mind. That is why throughout the Bible, and I like the way the three version puts it, Monsacra, Mwajing, change your mind. Because if you don't change your mind, you are likely to do something to glorify the desires of the sinful nature. So the mind is the deciding factor. Wherever the mind will tilt towards, if the mind tilts towards the flesh, the flesh will become stronger and overcome the spirit. And if the mind is filled with spiritual things. Then the, the mind will join the spirit and then they will overcome the flesh. So the frame, your frame of mind is critical. And therefore, if you want to win this battle, this civil war, and you fill your mind with chaff, for example, you are always watching pornography. Pornography and you are engaged in masturbation and all the filthy discussions going on, it means that your mind will be filled with sexual immoral activities. So the moment you are exposed to any temptation, immediately the mind which is filled with filth will now join the flesh and then they will overcome the spirit. Am I communicating? But if you fill your mind with things of God, your Bible reading, spiritual things, you are thinking about heaven, you are thinking about all the spiritual things, then the mind is already full with the word of God. And therefore, if when you are exposed to any sin or temptation, the mind will join the spirit to overcome the flesh. So brothers, if you hear of anything, somebody, a born again Christian, and he is still living in sin. If you are here this morning and you are still maintaining a conjugal boyfriend or girlfriend, somebody you haven't married and you are still engaged in sexual activity with, that means you are living in the flesh. You are gratifying the desires of the sinful nature. And that is why if you are a born again Christian, you can be an apostle, a pastor, a church leader, whatever. If you don't take care, this war that we are talking about, the, the spiritual war, you, a small girl, a small girl can just misbehave, I mean, disgrace you. When you lose your God. Let me end this message by sharing with you how you can win the battle. Within a few minutes, I'll be done. Are you ready with, to hear? So how to win the battle? Number one, live by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Number two, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Romans 12, 1. Offer your bodies. The Bible does not say offer your soul, offer your spirit. But it says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. What that means is that you are a normal human being. 
all the feelings and the passions and the desires are in your body as a normal human being. But offer all your body together with all the passion, the lust, the everything as a living sacrifice. So you sacrifice all that to God. No amen. No amen. Number three, renew your mind. Renew your mind. Uh, Romans 12, verse 2, renew your mind. Number four, do not live according to your sinful nature, but be led by the Spirit. So don't live according to your sinful nature. Number five, think of things above. Think of things above. Always let your mind be saturated with heavenly thoughts. The next is live in the light. Anything that is done in darkness, stay away from and live in the light. Number seven, do not love the world. This world that we find ourselves in. The more you can fake, the smarter you are. And now people are faking, 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 faking all over. And the temptation for you as a Christian to join in the faking business is very high. So do not love the world. And then the very last one is put on the new self and shed off the old self. So this old self, shut it off, let it go. And then you put on the new self. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For further reading, I want to leave you with Romans chapter 7. As you go home, please take your time to read through Romans chapter 7, where Paul was saying to them that, Oh, what a wretched man I am. The things I want to do, I am unable to do. The wrong thing that I don't want to do, they are the very things that I want to, that I, I'm doing. You see, the tension, the spirit flesh tension was also working in the life of Paul and the other Christian. And then Paul looking at it said, Oh, what a wretched man I am. Who can deliver me? From this war, thank God for Jesus Christ. So, brothers and sisters in the Lord, this morning what I've received from the Lord is what I have shared with you. There is a civil war in your life. But be victorious in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. God bless you all.